I say that I can resist anything but temptation. And uh, what I want to do today is take a look at how Jesus handled temptation, which might help us to handle temptation. Then I want to share with you how someone didn't handle it very well. And then some additional teaching on it. And so in Luke chapter 4, we see how Jesus handles temptation. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. Now, first off, Luke constantly talks about the Spirit and Jesus when Jesus, at Jesus' annunciation, the Holy Spirit was there. When Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit was there and descended upon him like a dove. And the Father stated, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And now we see that Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit once again. And the Holy Spirit is something that is constantly in the life of Jesus, which is something that we should also recognize that we should walk in the Spirit. Not only have the Spirit dwell upon us, but that we should walk in him. So Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when he had ended, he became hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now, G Satan isn't saying the if is like, well, I wonder if you are. The, the if is, if you are and you are the Son of God, then do these things. The temptation here is not that whether Jesus is or isn't the Son of God. Jesus knows that he is the Son of God. It has been revealed not only to him, but to those around him when he was baptized that he is the Son of God. So the temptation here is not that you are or not the Son of God and act like it, is are you going to use who you are to do what you want, or are you going to be controlled by what the Father wants? And so he says, well, why should you be hungry? After all, you're the son of God. Why should your circumstances be this way? Change your circumstances. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. Jesus acknowledges here that we are more than just physical. We are more, our needs are more than just what we eat and what we do and what we buy, but that there's more demand than this. And he is saying that man does not live by bread alone, but he lives in essence what God does. And so he's saying, I am not going to be dependent upon changing my circumstances to benefit me because I understand that man does not live on simply bread alone. And he led up up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all the, this dominion and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall be all yours. Now, it is interesting here, we're going to see Jesus' response, but Jesus could have several different responses to this. He could have a a theological and an intellectual debate as to whether Satan actually does own everything. Because God is sovereign, God created the world, so he could have a debate whether it is Satan's to give or not, or we could have a theological debate, well, man was supposed to have dominion, and when he fell into temptation, that that now became Satan's, and Satan is the ruler of this world. But the scriptures say that he's the prince of the world, not the ruler of the world. And most of us would get in, caught in the minutia of the theological Jesus doesn't. He doesn't discuss whether Satan owns it or doesn't own it, has the authority to give it or doesn't give it. He's also telling Jesus, you've come to ransom the world. I'll make it easy on you. I'll give it to you. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to die. You don't have to establish the kingdom of heaven. I'll give you all the kingdoms. If you just do just one thing, worship me. And in essence, that has been Satan's great desire, all that we know of him. He was jealous of God because God is the one who receives worship. And he wants us to worship him. 
And so he says, Jesus, if you will worship me, you don't have to go through the heartache and pain and separation. You don't have to lead up Calvary's cross. You can have it all if you will worship me. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. You see, Jesus gets to the crux of it. He can discuss all the theological aspects of, of the world and not. He's going, no, no. The, the central point here is that there is God only, and we are to worship him and him alone, and we are to serve him and him alone. You see, Jesus answers Satan's attacks with Scripture, but the fundamental Scripture. It is God who is to be worshipped, and it is God who is to be served. And sometimes when we get so active and we get placed in our lives, we forget the centrality, that it is God that we worship and God that we serve. And when we're at our jobs, we are so busy oftentimes concerned about our supervisor or our boss or what the stock market might think or what our fellow employees might think. And the reality is you may be employed by that company, but your job is to serve God. Now we're going to come to the third attack. If you are a student of the scriptures, you will know that in Matthew and in Mark, when they discuss these three here temptations, that they're in different order. The order is not important. As a matter of fact, I think what we tend to think is during these 40 days that Jesus is tempted three different times. No, these are three of the outstanding aspects of the temptation during the 40 days, but Jesus has been hit and hit and hit and hit by the devil. And so he comes to this third one to give us a sense of these temptations. Verse 9, it says, And he led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on a pinnacle of the temple. Now, there was some writings at this time that said that the Messiah would announce himself by standing on the pinnacle of the temple. So in essence, Satan is going, okay, here you go. You are the Son of God. You're the Messiah. We're going to announce you here. We're going to place you on the pinnacle of the temple. And said to him, if you are the Son of God, and you are, Throw yourself down from here, for it is written. So now Satan is going to quote scripture to Jesus. However, he's not going to give him the whole sense of the scripture. But even that as it may, Jesus is going to see the attack. He will, give, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on your hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. He's going, you are the Son of God. You are the Messiah. And if that's the case, then God is not going to let anything happen to you. So jump off. He'll let you float to the ground so that you don't even strike your foot on the rock. And Jesus answered and said to him, and Jesus will again quote Scripture. It is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. He strikes at the fundamental attack in this temptation. Yes, I can do that. But my job is not to test God. God is above the test. So you can quote scripture all you want. But the serious thing is, is you shall love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. I'm not going to test God when God tells me something. And when the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. A very little sentence that we tend to overlook in our lives. Because sometimes, a few times, when we're successful at resisting the devil, we think we won. The battle's over. 
The war is done and we can live our lives now as if we've vanquished the devil. The situation is, is that you may have won that time, but he will come back again and again and again. And so he did in Jesus' life. So we see that Jesus took and said, I am going to respond to your temptations with scripture, accurate scripture, not just the words, but the intent. That I understand what it is God is doing, and I'm not going to quote scripture to make God do anything. I'm not going to put God to the test. Now, there was another couple who had some temptation. They didn't do so well. We took a look at them uh, back in our other study, but I want to remind you, and that's back in Genesis chapter 3. It says this, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. So right off, what Satan does is he causes doubt. Did God really say that? Can you trust that? Did he really say it? And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the tree of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. She quotes part of the scripture, but she has embellished what God has said. What God had said, if you look back, is that you shall not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There was nothing, anything about touching. Now, what I may think happened is Adam may have been responsible for this, or maybe she added to it the sense of, we're going to build this wall around it so we, don't, so we won't touch it, and if we don't touch it, then we can't eat it and everything will be cool. But the problem is, is when you misquote God, and then you do what you did to misquote God, and nothing happens, you think, oh, that I can go further. So if I don't touch it, if I touch it, I'll die. And then she touches it and nothing happens. Then maybe God was a liar. And that's what Satan attempts to do. The liar tries to make God to be the liar. You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. And their serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. God doesn't mean what he says. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Don't you want to be like God? You'll, you can be exactly like God. Because after all, that's what the devil's wanting to do, to be just like God. And to cast doubt on upon him. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and there was a light to the eye... And that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. This little passage probably tells us why we get in more trouble than in any other temptations. We hang around. They always say where there's smoke, there's fire. So let's say, I hate to use real sin because... Either I point at you or I point at me and we all get uncomfortable. So I'm going to use chocolate. Let's say chocolate is one of your sins that, that Satan just knows how to beat you up. And so what you do is you walk downtown and there's this chocolate store. And there's lots of chocolate in the window. Now, if you are wise... And you understand that your weakness is chocolate. You either cross the street or you walk really fast and you look not at the window. But that's not what Eve did and that's not what we do. She stopped at the window and go, wow, that's really good chocolate. There's a big chocolate bar and there's some kisses and there's fudge and there's all this great and I've been good on my diet. You know, I deserve a little bad. I'll just go into the store. 
I won't eat any of it. I'll just, I'll just go in. And then we go in and we go, oh, that chocolate smells so good. I won't eat any of it. I'll just smell it. And depending upon how strong you are, you either smell it for a long time or you go up to the lady and say, 10 pounds of chocolate, please. I'll just take it home. I won't eat it. I'll just take it home. And you know you've lied to yourself the entire time. But that's how we are with temptation. We, we, we hang around it. We pretend whether we're strong, we pretend, but when it comes right down to it, just as she took from its fruit and ate. And unfortunately, oftentimes when that happens, as it further says, and she also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. Frequently, when we are involved in temptation and sin, we do not limit it to ourselves. We try to justify ourselves by having others fall into the same temptation. Well, they weren't strong, so that's okay. I'm excused because we're all just human, aren't we? I just, you know, I love chocolate, and, and you love chocolate, so we'll just all love chocolate together. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus said, thou shalt not eat chocolate. Doesn't go by the candy store. Doesn't hang out at the window. He says what God has said, how God has said it, with the intent that God had said it, and said, since I am going to serve God only, it doesn't matter how much I love chocolate. It doesn't matter how much you love chocolate. We're going to walk as if that chocolate store does not exist. So there is some additional teaching that helps us to deal with testing and, and temptations and trials. And we find that in James chapter 1. James chapter 1 tells us this at verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Interesting. Now, he's not talking about temptations at this point. He's talking about trials. He's talking about difficulties in life. And in life, even if your life is perfect, there are trials and tribulations. And James gives us a very unique perspective. He doesn't say, oh, man, why me? He says, consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. Why? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. You see, the more that I succeed in the trials and say, I am going to trust God and him alone. I'm not going to trust the circumstances. I'm not going to trust Satan. I'm not going to trust all those other people. I'm going to trust God. As you do that, your faith becomes stronger. And when your faith becomes stronger, you're able to endure more and more and more. You see, it is very difficult to run a marathon if you can't run 100 yards. At this point, I, my exercise is about going up two flights of stairs at my parking structure. If I had to walk up the nine flights of the stairs at my office, I'm not too sure I could do it. Faith is similar in the same way. You can't expect to have faith that moves mountains if you don't have faith that says, I will be still and know that you are God. As we face these various trials, the purpose of it is to strengthen our faith, to, faith, to give us endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing so God is not upset with you when you face all these various trials and tribulations. What God is doing is saying, I'm trying to strengthen your faith. So think of that in joy. 
And then verse 12, it says this, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So not only does God say, if you face these various trials and you endure and, and you succeed, that you will have endurance. But not only will you have endurance and faith, I'm going to give you the crown. Which then causes us to look and say, would I rather have chocolate or would I rather have the crown from God? And quite frankly, most of us would rather have chocolate. Which gets us right back to the fact that we do not want to please God or serve him. We still want to do our own thing. So it gets right back to the crux of it. But when you say, I'm willing to deny myself that I might serve him. then God says, not only will your faith increase, but I am going to give you a crown. Then he says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. So number one, when you come to temptation, you understand who the enemy is, and it is not God. It is not God who tempts you by evil because God doesn't tempt you. It flats out says it here. The tempter is two people. I'm going to deal with the first one who gets the most of the credit, and that's the devil or Satan. Because there are times when we try to break out of what it is, and we try to break out of our love of chocolate, let's say. It is the devil who seems to build a new chocolate store that we didn't know about, so we run into it. So he is there. And oftentimes when we decide that we want to serve God and serve him alone, that is when Satan is displeased and he attacks us because the last thing he wants is for us to serve God and him alone and so there are times in our lives when Satan does attack us and he is a vicious enemy like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour he is a very real and present enemy and we need to watch him however he is nothing in compared to Jesus. God is so powerful that he simply instructs an angel to take him and throw him into the pit. It's not like, well, good is here and evil is here. They just, no. When God has had enough, he's done. So our enemy is nowhere near as powerful as we let him be. But there is a second enemy, and most of us, because what we do is, is the, for those of you, most, most of you in this room, many of you probably will hear this message, and some of you don't remember the character who used to say, the devil made me do it. And we love to say, well, the devil made me do it, because then I am not at fault. It's him. But notice what James says. Verse 14, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it has given birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Paul is, I mean, James is using the very same scenario here that I use as my chocolate story. I like chocolate. I want to eat chocolate. I pass by a chocolate store. I look at it. It makes me feel good. I say, well, I won't eat it. All thing. And James is saying, when lust it develops within us, that is when we sin. It's our own passions, our own desires that causes us to falter. But going back, to Jesus' handling of temptation, he said this, man does not live by bread alone. Man does not live by chocolate alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So when we are tempted, 
we need to do several things. One, flee from the temptation and accurately understand the scripture. One of the problems, just like Eve did, we will misquote the scripture to either justify ourselves or to condemn others. We need to accurately divine the word of God. And that is how, and that is our most potent weapon. I know the ladies are studying the passage in Ephesians about being a prayer warrior. And it talks about the armor of God. Every aspect to the armor of God in Ephesians is a defensive protection. The breastplate, the shoes, all of those things. There is one thing only that is a weapon. And that is the sword of God. That you can use as a weapon against Satan and all his fiery darts. Now, we've seen that Jesus handled all of these temptations during these 40 days and through all of his life. And we have seen Eve and Adam and we've seen in our own lives that we miserably fail. Here's the awesome thing about our God. Even though we have miserably failed in our resisting temptation, Hebrews tells us something. In chapter 4 of Hebrews, verse 14, it's not on the screen. Don't worry about it. It says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. The writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus knows exactly what you're going through because he was tempted just like we are. But the difference is he did it without sin. But he understands our weakness and he understands that we have been failures in resisting. But he sympathizes with us. You would think someone who is perfect would say, well, I did it, you do it too. But that's not Jesus' way. He is a high priest who intercedes for us, but he is a high priest who understands exactly what it is that we have gone through. Now, this doesn't tell us that Jesus knows by the fact that he is aware it doesn't say that Jesus knows because he is aware of your problems, that he is aware of your suffering, that he is aware of your temptations. It says Jesus knows because he was there on the front line just as you, and he was tempted in every way just as you have been tempted, and quite frankly, more. Because nobody ever called me the Messiah. So I've never had to deal with what kind of Messiah should I be? Should I make it the easy route or be the suffering servant? But Jesus had to. You see, each of us are unique, but our experiences are common. You may have a problem with broccoli and not chocolate. I don't. Broccoli will never tempt me. Now, chocolate, on the other hand. But it says here that Jesus isn't just aware of your situation. He's lived it. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When we're at that chocolate store at the window, instead of saying, I'll just look at it for a while, that is the time to go to prayer. 
Say, God, I'm weak. Help me to turn my back. Help me to cross the street. Help me to do what I need to do because I am weak. But I also understand that you sympathize with my weakness and you've been there. So I'm not asking a God who doesn't have a clue what's happening to me. You've been there. So help me to understand how I might be strong. That I might resist this temptation. And serve you better. Oftentimes. When we're at that critical time in our life about temptation. Or when we failed and ate the chocolate. We then say, well, I ate the chocolate. I'm no good. And then we go out and eat the rest of the 10 pounds of the chocolate. Rather than saying, my God loves me and gives me mercy. And I'm going to run to him, even though I know I'm a sinner. Because he loves me, not for who I think I ought to be, but because he is going to make me like him. So instead of running away when we have failed, we need to run to him. You see, Adam and Eve ran away. They hid but God sought them out. When we have failed, we need to run to him. But even better, before we fail, we need to run to him because he knows. And all God's people said. 